Sure, you can tell a McPherson strut suspension from a double wishbone, but do you know the pros and cons of each type, and can you say camber effect six times fast while eating cheese? My name is Philip Trianic. I'm the owner and engineer at Cortex Racing. I went to school for mechanical engineering because I love cars. Not I went to mechanical engineering school and then I realized I like cars. It was in that order. Um, and I've done a lot of um, study, research, development in that field uh, starting back even before college and then through college. Uh, I started my own company, Cortex Racing. Um, a number of years ago and uh, designed and developed all the products that we have now uh, along with my team. I'm currently a uh, uh, chassis setup engineer for Rehagen Racing for this year's the 2015 Pirelli World Challenge Series. I'm here today we're going to discuss some various suspension types and how all that geometry plays together. In today's world, there's generally uh, a couple type of types of front suspension designs that are, are on almost every new car. Um, we've got the McPherson strut type, which is probably on most cars because it's relatively simple and less expensive and also transfers, it's easier to have it uh, transfer less noise to uh, the cabin of the car and NVH and that sort of thing. For a McPherson strut, what you have is a strut assembly that's connected to the spindle. It's bolted directly to it, so they, in, in essence, become one assembly. And then the tire is bolted to it. And Along with that, you've got um, a lower control arm that is pivoting at the chassis. So on the McPherson strut, there's another mount, usually up at the shock. It's called the shock, in the shock tower, like up normally right uh, at the cowl level where this is attached. And so it, it's a, able to rotate here and down here, and that establishes the suspension geometry. The other important thing to note with the McPherson strut is for alignment changes, they're typically done by moving the, this pivot point um, inboard or outboard to, to change camber, and um, looking at the, from the top of the car, you'd move it forward and back to adjust the caster value. Advantages of this setup is it's, pretty strong, like it has, it can hold a lot of load, um, mainly because the mounting points are a far distance from where the loads are being applied down at the tires. The main disadvantage of, of this uh, suspension type is that um, in bump, we're not getting a lot of camber gain in the suspension. Let's draw the, the SLA on this side to contrast. So we've got a SLA or short long arm suspension over here. And it's gonna have the same lower control arm that we had over here, very similar. It'll have the, the spindle, but instead of um, a strut bolted directly to the spindle, you're going to have another control arm and another and a ball joint here. So we have a ball joint top and bottom. And then we'd have our spindle. So we've got a pivot point here, a pivot point here, here, and here. So what happens is, is when you go into um, bump or rebound, um, the shorter upper arm has 
a tighter arc than the longer lower arm. So in compression generally, um, it's pulling the lower ball joint in quicker than the upper ball joint is moving inboard and that causes the angle of the tire to go more negative. On this one, on the McPherson strut, it's the same as an upper control arm, but if you, so if you drew an upper control arm here at 90 degrees between these two pivot points, then that would be uh, equivalent of this except for on the McPherson strut, it's not pivoting at this point where the entire arm would basically be moving up and down at that predetermined angle. So it's essentially a slider joint and uh, it's not getting shorter or longer. It's the only camber gain that you're really experiencing is due to the angle or the inclinate, the, the, this inclination angle through the strut um, upper mounting point and the lower control arm. What's the disadvantage there? Um, it seems like you could just set your camber angle to what you wanted before you started and you'd be done with it. And that's essentially what we're doing on race cars. Um, and it works relatively well. Um, but today's tires like a lot of camber, especially radial tires do like a lot of camber to work well, uh, upwards of three, four, five degrees. Um, and if you set that much, if you set a lot of static, um, negative camber, then the car is probably not going to brake as well. It, like the tire will not be flat to the road. So in the braking zones, you're essentially, the handling is going to suffer. With the SLA setup, you can still set, you know, you still set a relatively high uh, negative camber uh, value, but you're not going as high because the as the body rolls and the, the suspension compresses, it's going to gain more camber. So if you say you set this one at three, then you probably have to set this one at five to accomplish the similar goal. The, ge the, the factory has put in a certain um, geometry into all this. And if you try to lower the car, then it's, this inner pivot point is going to go closer to the ground, but this one at the ball joint is not because that's determined by the tire. So you end up with, with uh, the lower control arm over center. So it's actually, uh, what happens is, is that the, the ball joint in compression, it pulls more in, inward, which takes away additional camber. On a strut, if you change ride height, it's much more detrimental to the geometry of it. Um, on a well-designed SLA, it's more tolerant to um, changing ride heights and still maintaining decent geometry. On a Mustang, you probably might if you limit the uh, to lowering it maybe like an inch, but if you go like, say you slam your car two and a half inches, then the geometry is gonna be pretty messed up and you're gonna have to take some other actions to restore that before you actually see any performance improvements. The scrub radius is defined by um, when the steering axis is projected down to the ground plane, um, where the tire contact patches is the distance between the center of the tire and, um, and the, the steering axis um, point. Um, so on a McPherson strut, um, because uh, the strut is next to the tire, you can't get the tire in as far, moving the center of the tire closer. So they, they generally tilt that over further to get a higher angle because that does get the steering axis in deeper into the wheel by the time you project it down to the ground. So you're trying to minimize that because it causes the steering generally to be heavy. When you buy a car from the factory, they, they do spend a lot of time in, in getting the scrub radius right. So if you move to a different wheel and tire package and you're essentially um, changing the, where the center of the tire is at, like for example with wheel spacers or with different offsets, then that is affecting the whole steering geometry of the car. Uh, if you don't have an adequate caster um, with a high, um, steering uh, axis inclination, then you're gonna lose a lot of camber when with steering input. If you looked at the spindle, 
from the center. When you steer, when you steer this point, when you go through the, you know, like say you do a full turn on your steering wheel, like to one side and the other, this, the car is raising up and down. And the higher the caster value and the more steering inclination, the more this is gonna happen. Um, so you're, when you steer, you're, you're effectively lifting the car off, the, you know, you're raising the car up and down. So that's why it feels heavy when you have a lot of caster. The OEMs are, are actually moving away from this. If you look at most new cars, um, what they're doing is instead of this here, they've got this big thing that comes over and it's the spindle just becomes huge and there's a relief and the tire fits in here and then they're putting the ball joint way up here. And that's actually kind of cool because um, earlier we talked about how the strut was really strong and the loads were low way up here at this mounting point because they're a long distance from here. So if you do this, you're, all, you're getting back to, you know, essentially a mounting point that's closer to where this is, but you still have the SLA. Pretty much every, um, you know, luxury or performance high-end car is using this arrangement, like a Nissan GTR, for example, has that set up. You know, that's, that's probably the most challenging aspect to figure out. Um, if you've got like a, a pure race car, what you can do is uh, essentially air the tires up really high, put, uh, remove the shocks and just put solid links in there so it can't body roll. And then what, what we used to do uh, for little formula cars is put it on a platform and get um, like a crane or a forklift and put like a digital level on it and you would just keep going until you reach the balance point. The reality is, is that you, you'll probably never know exactly what your center of gravity is, but you know, like for street cars that have been modified for performance use, um, I think a good number is maybe around 18 inches off the ground. You know, that's not accurate, but when you start doing your calculations, um, most of them are like for chassis setup and such, uh, they're usually based on um, you know, you, you, you go out and do some testing and get a benchmark and then you do some calculations and they're relative to your starting point. So if you, um, you use your 18 inch center of gravity and make calculations based on that and then want to go in a different direction, you know, you might not have the absolute correct numbers, uh, but it'll give you, um, it'll tell you which way you're going and, be, and allow you to actually figure out you know, it, it'll direct you in the correct direction. Yeah, it, yeah, exactly. At least at, at Cortex, when we lower a Mustang, we also um, install uh, different ball joints that readjusts the, the angle of the, the front lower control arms and the suspension. The general philosophy is that we, we get the CG down in the car by lowering it, but then we go back and um, and and fix all of the negatives that came along with it. So we we end up with a car that has as good or better suspension geometry than it did from the factory, but with the lower CG. We're just doing the positive modification, which is lower CG, which you know there's there's no negatives to just lowering your CG if you can do that on its own. <laughs>